So it's really been amazing to watch everything that's happened over the last eight and a half years. On the one hand, it feels like a lifetime. It is effectively a big chunk of my lifetime. On the other hand, it still blows my mind from that Bitcoin conference of, I don't know, what, let's say there's 50, 60 people in a room. Yeah. So the industry, uh, the, we can actually call ourselves an industry, finally. This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Angel Block. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. All right, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. What is up? I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching another epic episode of Untold Stories, where together, twice a week, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders, brilliant people, those who are teaching us a lot of things, the topics of today, the things we want to learn about the, you know, the, the big future of tomorrow. Um, and, you know, kind of everything in between and, and all the different people that have been in our industry for a very long time or just joining. But really, and you guys know, especially the OGs that have been listening to this show for a while, that there's not one show that goes by that our minds are not blown by something and some cool untold story uh, is told. And we have a lot of fun along the way. Uh, as you guys have uh, probably noticed, we've been doing kind of this, this theme lately of what are people building during this bear market? What, you know, if I look back on my 10 to 12 year history in the space, it's always been timing. I feel like I've always seen, well, I, I may not have invested in or got involved in some of the things, but I've always like seen some of the waves of when projects were small and then when they became successful later on and what kind of the timing and the different traits and the different things like that. And then at the same time, um, a lot of us want to work in the industry and we want to know what, where the best places to go and what to do. Uh, so I'm really excited to have uh, continuing that theme, having on the show today, Jamie Burke. Thank, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories today. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. I'm really excited. It's, uh, it was a great summer. I'm excited for the, for the, for the fall. It's already probably uh, winter in a lot of places, but it seems like it's been a warm winter. Um, but a little bit of an extension of crypto winter. We saw yesterday uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and actually today the the where, where you are the Federal Res the uh, the Bank of England raised their their interest rates. There's a lot of crazy things going on, and everyone's going into cash, but you guys are doing the opposite. You founded Outlier Ventures, Europe's first venture fund and platform dedicated to blockchain and Web three. You guys have over a hundred. Uh, startups that have come out of your program. You guys built a, 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 an, a very impressive portfolio that includes industry-defining projects like Brave Browser, Fetch AI, Ocean Protocol, which I just talked to my guest yesterday about, Secret Network, and, and totally other ones. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with some people from your team uh, with my fund, Drew Adventures, and, and see how we could collaborate there. So that's been really exciting learning from, from some of your all-star team. But I mean, Tell us why you decided to go full time into into you know crypto and Web three because there are a lot of other industries that you were uh, working in before I'm sure. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me on, Charlie. Really looking forward to to chatting this through with you. So basically, um, I've personally been in crypto for almost a decade now. It's about eight and a half years, which is terrifying actually um <laughs> yeah. almost a decade pa passed by um and of course in in crypto time you know that feels like two three decades of, of productivity right the, 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 the level of output that you have to produce i'm exhausted yeah i have i have that feeling um certainly towards the end of the week um and uh you know so if i, I try and go back in time that far you know uh, and remember what was the inflection point it's difficult to recall right because as you know when you when you kind of make decisions in life um there's the story you tell yourself like this yeah. really neat neat obvious thing um and then there's the reality um in the the reality was at, at that particular point i'd been a, a serial entrepreneur primarily in uh, digital change, innovation. Originally, I kind of came up through uh, the communications ad industry. So I worked at WPP, 
which was like number two comms group at the time globally um and was just in the right time right place uh i was the youngest person in the room at a time when when web two was happening um and so kind of rode that wave and and really saw firsthand how industries large multinationals did or didn't respond to technical innovations and the kind of impact that that would have on their business um beyond communications and um and so that kind of really, really stuck with me, I guess. Uh, there was a deep appreciation for how challenging it can be for large organizations, let alone whole industries, to adapt. And so kind of carrying that with me, carrying that baggage with me in a way, um, when I happened upon Bitcoin um, and crypto more generally, on the one hand, it's innovations were obvious um the idea that you could have something that was digital and scarce was just revolutionary yeah um in the context of almost every industry right um at the same time knowing all these experiences that i'd had with complex organizations it didn't feel like they would be interacting or integrating bitcoin anytime soon in, into their supply chains um, mm. and so you know, that, that's not a slight on Bitcoin. Bitcoin's incredibly powerful and I, I'm really excited about its future and with lightning. Um, but what was clear was that, you know, there, there would need to be a multi-chain universe. Um, now remembering that this was pre-Ethereum, yeah. um, you know, that wasn't necessarily obvious to everybody. Um, and but but it was kind of core to to my understanding now, at that point really difficult to predict exactly the direction everything would take um and i certainly wouldn't say that i i knew that it would happen as quickly as this i mean even reflecting over eight and a half years it still felt like when i began first began looking at it i remember i went to the first bitcoin conference in europe and it was, I don't know, 50, 60 people. Yeah. Um, a lot of them had come over from the US. So there wasn't really like a local scene, a native scene. I'm based here in London. Um, and it was it was a very kind of political movement at, at that point. Um, there wasn't so much focus on, and it was and it was really about money, you know, at, at its core, it was about principles around money, sound money. Um, and there wasn't really much discussion about broader commercial application, like, you know, thinking about how it could be applied to, to different industries outside of yeah. the very kind of narrow financial services. Was it that Bitcoin London conference in 2014 or something or 13? I was trying to remember the year and it was all I remember. I think was it, it in was, the yeah, city of was, London? Yeah, it was. Canary Wharf. Yeah, Canary Wharf. Okay, yeah. so I remember that very clearly, that conference. I remember exactly... Very vivid memory. In fact, when I ever write my book, that conference was a pivotal moment of my life. And a lot of people were there and it was crazy. But you're right. It was a fintech only conference. It was not related to anything outside of like finance and money. And we were in the city of London, you know, so we were in like the center of, at the time, at least the global financial world. Uh, and, um, Oh yeah, this is bringing back a flood of memories to that. That was like the first real, that was the first time I remember, because I've been going back to all these conferences, back to the, to the first one, that there was actually like mainstream media there. So I was getting interviewed now by like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times, when in the past it was all like, like they were actually taking us seriously a little bit in that conference. It was interesting. Yeah, it was a serious moment. And actually it was my first experience of a crypto community everything else until that point had been quite abstract right it was all all online it was very us focused you know a lot of the communities there were quite quite us focused um and yeah all of a sudden you're in canary wharf we we yeah it pretty much filled out i would say a, a decent yeah. sized conference space as you said and and there was mainstream media were there 
there were people from you know the big banks were already there um but it was a it was a very narrow conversation uh, or a very narrow debate and coming from my world so i wasn't from financial services i wasn't from banking um and in my head i was thinking about all the use cases when you begin to think of you know a distributed ledger you start to think of digitally scarce things um and it, and it just wasn't none of these things that were in my head that felt obvious to me were were being talked about at least in that room um and so for me that was like an inflection point i don't it might not have been the inflection point but it was it was definitely a moment that triggered in my mind that i had something to add to the space add to the the story of crypto perhaps to extend it yeah deepen it or, or make it relevant to to more people it's so interesting because i never would have thought that anyone was even in that room that was thinking about bitcoin or there was no really crypto talk yet it was just still bitcoin other than financial services and you know i wasn't a i came just more from like the business world so even my my uh my technical knowledge i would delegate to um some smarter people that were involved in the early bitcoin days and i remember what you said just now about multi-chain world uh the consensus back then was that everything should and could be built on bitcoin and still is to a lot of people but that's yeah. kind of and and that debate you know to be honest and comes down to my personal beliefs is that there are a lot of things that should be built on on bitcoin and i think that bitcoin is kind of happy of what it is and where it is and what it was meant to be and now i do see that like the bitcoin versus everything else tribalism going away and you're seeing more of the tribalism with the other chains but that kind of has gone away with the bear market too i've noticed that that's been been fizzling a lot lately too yeah and look i think there's always these cycles right where there's a, a lot of experimentation and innovation and and uh, as is expected with with innovation and experimentation, there's a lot of failures, there's a lot of learnings, and usually in that cycle, then people come back to Bitcoin, and now they come back to Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? There's 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 a there's very few protocols and networks that are kind of consistently there. Yeah, but my belief is that you need experimentation, you need um, you need options and variety, you know, for this to be a, a an ecosystem, and and everything has its place. So, um, and what was interesting, I'm you know, kind of reflecting on that particular moment, was pretty much soon after that, you ended up with um, R three launched around about that time. I'm trying yes. to think if it was pre or post Ethereum. I think it was. It was around the same time. R3 yeah. was supposed to be this like consortium of banks, right? And doing banks and uh, doing something like enterprise or permissioned blockchains or something like that. Yeah. And, and actually, that was a, another big moment. I remember seeing the two founders, co-founders, presented a crypto meetup. So yeah, it must have been after Ethereum because it was an Ethereum meetup, I think. And... Um, and uh, you know, they were kind of pitching this vision to a room full of effectively hackers yeah. that, you know, they were going to bring all, all these banks online <laughs> and, and everyone's like, what the hell are you talking about? But the crazy thing is they did it. They did do it. I mean, at least they built the consortium. Yeah. And all of a sudden, every week there was a new bank saying, you know, they're going to be, and there's this whole Bitcoin, blockchain, not Bitcoin narrative. And, and that built up a lot of headwind. It made people, a lot of people feel less threatened. Yeah. Um, DLTs that, that was were a big talk like distributed ledger technology yeah. became lingo I remember like one consensus year it was like consensus uh, 2015 or 16 it was like all about DLTs you couldn't find the word blockchain in the whole place or something yeah well people so I think you had kind of at that time you're, you're kind of hardcore Bitcoin maxis and then you had a large group of other people who are either splinters off that or people that were trying to sanitize it somehow in order that it could be more acceptable 
Yeah, um, that's a great way to describe what was going on, actually. Um, and it worked, right? It, it did for a moment. It, it, it did. It certainly drove attention. And all of a sudden, uh, I, I can't try to remember how many years into my journey into crypto it was, but it, it couldn't have been more than a couple of years. Um, all of a sudden, people knew it wasn't fringe. Like people, the, the blockchain term had had been um, had a lot of media coverage. Obviously, Bitcoin yeah. was was still seen as the the, the, the main thing. Um, and you began to see uh, it was quite a regional focus for us at the time. You know, here in London, because we had that financial center, um, you saw a lot of people leaking out of the big banks um and either angel investing or, or trying to create like a, a enterprise grade equivalents of, of blockchains um so it was an interesting moment but, but like throughout all of that we um so i actually found like you i, I kind of delegate the, the kind of technical part to what was a founding partner a guy called Anvar van Amers, dutch guy who i actually found on linkedin he was the only person was great he was one of like 10 people that had <laughs> I'm a blockchain developer on his LinkedIn profile. Um, and he was in Europe and Netherlands isn't that far from here in the UK. And so we agreed to meet up and um, he made sense. Like he was one of the first people that as a non-developer coming into the space, slightly overwhelmed. Because at that point, you know, it was it was quite a hardcore cryptography, you know, class of people who were who were kind of the, the te technical brains behind a lot of stuff that was going on um and he was the first person that kind of made sense i could understand and then also had a kind of a commercial background deploying um technical solutions in, in an enterprise context so um I, I kind of pretty much just said look i don't know where this is going um i'm creating this thing called outlier ventures you know, we want to become a, an investor in space. At that time, I probably would have said the VC. Yeah. Um, but I need a, a technical partner. Um, and I think I agreed to like retain him for a year. I said, look, let me just put you on this monthly retainer for a year. I think he quit his job. Um, it allowed him to go full time into the space beyond just this kind of part time curiosity or hobby. And, um, and away we went. And, and at that time, we were still trying to figure out like, what we would invest in. There weren't really lots of startups, like classic startups floating around at that time. Yeah. Um, so we started to do some applied learning. We were almost like a venture studio model. We said, well, look, we, we can think of these use cases between him and I. We thought of several use cases. And we thought, okay, let's try and build dApps that are going to allow you to execute that in, in basic form. Um, and usually he just breaks stuff. Well, he's just constantly breaking stuff. And of course, there was no how-to manual um, to, to figure out what, what was going on. Um, so very quickly, we, we kind of got really good technical grounding in, in the, the stack that was available at that time and, and just realized that a lot more infrastructure needed to be built before any there was of these nothing use cases would be possible. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, well, I was just saying, you know, we, so uh, coming off the back of this like, R3 stuff and all of a sudden there was a lot of blockchain washing, right? So there's a lot of blockchain startups emerging, trying to raise money. And actually, if you look, looked at them and what they built, they not built anything on a, on a blockchain. It was almost all conceptual and that wasn't their fault. It was because <laughs> you, you couldn't, you couldn't build anything that that would work at scale um even in a let alone even in an mvp instance so so i think around about that time i did a, a blog post which was deliberately provocative but it was like 99 percent of blockchain startups are bullshit um and it it kind of got picked up a little bit in the community I remember that yeah. um and actually it wasn't that much of a slight because 90 percent of startups are bullshit in that they'll fail you know and so yeah. it was just saying that there's even more bullshit uh, and there's even a higher probability of failure with uh, these so-called blockchain startups. And we published that as like a blog post. Um, and that really kind of started the journey off for us of, of thinking aloud 
you know, and and through um, through thought leadership, kind of connecting with with innovators in the space. But at that point, we we made a, a commitment that we were just going to focus entirely on infrastructure. So you mentioned some of the projects um, yeah. that we worked with at the beginning. Um, many of those projects were we kind of engaged as um, more as an incubator. So uh, sometimes people conflate incubator and an accelerator. And I'll, I can maybe explain the difference a little bit later when we talk about what we've become, which is very much an accelerator. Um, but back then it was it was as an incubator where we would work with people building infrastructure, highly technical teams, um, and we would we would work with them in what was effectively R and D. It was like multi year yeah. R and D. I would focus more on the commercialization, and would focus more on the technical component. Um, and and that saw us, you know, begin to work with um, different projects uh, here initially, primarily after the European ecosystem. Um, so you mentioned Ocean, you mentioned Fetch.ai, um, and even further back than that, IOTA, um, because at that point, a lot of the commercial partners that we were speaking to were were looking at this stuff and thinking about how they could apply it to their supply chains with different requirements, whether it was IoT. Okay, how do I, I don't know if you remember, but when Ethereum launched, there was a huge amount of focus on, of course, it being this this uh, world computer, but sure. also unlock a door, you know, and I think it was, was it Stefan Chul who, who started demoing, you can unlock a door with your wallet and all these IoT yep. use cases. I, IoT was a big focus back then for Ethereum. Um, yeah, we were people were, we were putting uh, NFC chips inside of our fingers back then to like build Ethereum computers that you could only unlock doors like with what's inside your, like crazy stuff. It, I mean, this was like you said, a room's full of hackers that banks are talking, it still was back then. It's funny you say that. I don't know if you can see it. I've actually got a chip in my hand. Where's the camera? It's in, in my left hand. Where? Um, hosting a panel on oh. stage, and they microchipped me on the stage. And it's never done. I almost, I wanted to do it. I didn't pull the, the trigger, actually. Yeah, no I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you, didn't, uh, you didn't lose out on anything. I basically got a bit of metal in my hand that's never done anything. It never worked. So I, it's probably going to kill me in the end. So uh, but there you go. Um, so I've got yeah, the debris of, of so uh, cool. hubris of IoT use cases uh, in, embedded in me. Um, but that was very much a focus, right? It was everyone was thinking about with Ethereum, all of a sudden came this, you know, we can do more than just money. We can do more than just, um, than just uh, thinking through pure financial use cases. Um, and so there was a lot of experimentation then. It wasn't necessarily clear Ethereum would become what it's become. And there are lots of other different approaches at the time, um, blockchains or non-blockchains, you know, decentralized acyclical graphs. That's what IOTA were doing at the time, working with a lot of the German industrial base um, partners that we brought to the table, like Bosch and Siemens and, and things like that. Um, uh, with with fetch.ai these were a couple of early people that span out of well not span out of they were um the first investor and the first uh developer at um deepmind the like very successful ai company that google bought um to become their ai proposition and they were looking at from an ai perspective how could we leverage um, blockchain technology and infrastructure and they ended up initially trying to build a a layer one and and uh, like most um evolved into uh, what is now a part of cosmos or, or yeah. you know, other um, tender other solutions um an ocean ocean protocol was another one trent who i'd known for a long time was thinking about it in a data sense and so actually at that time we we published a thesis every couple of years we publish a, a, a bit of a thesis and it's normally a little bit too far ahead for people to kind of fully grasp um, and at that point, it was called the Convergence Thesis. You can still find it on our website, actually. But it was effectively saying we can't look at blockchain in isolation. We have to start thinking about how it's going to converge with big data um, as a data substrate. You know, how is it going to lead to the commodification of data? 
Um, if so, how is that going to connect with the IoT devices? Um, how is AI machine learning then going to be able to benefit from, from data? And so we actually looked at this from, you know, IoT devices collecting the data, blockchains organizing and commodifying the data, and AI consuming the data. And we, we kind of laid that out as a, a vision, and that led us to work with uh, a lot of these like fundamental technologies that, that could enable that vision, many of which were really ahead of their time. And I would say maybe even only now are starting to like be un be understood. Um, and so we did that for, for several years. And because it was very intensive work, we could only really work with a handful of projects every year, um, which didn't really scale for us. It was very profitable. We did very well financially as an investor. Um, we never really invested a huge amount of capital. It was more value. So we, time, would, yeah. we kind of grew our team. Um, uh, to kind of give that advice as as we we worked with people across the different life cycles, um, and that that eventually led to what Outlier is today, um, about four and a half years ago, which is as an accelerator. And so, to kind of come back to this distinction between incubator and accelerator, so you know, an in incubator really is, um, as I said, working at the research stage. It's pre product market fit you might have a basic MVP and it, and it's certainly pre-commercialization, which was natural back then. Cause you know, we were so far away from, um, uh, we were so far away from commercializing anything, but now the world's very different, right? You look at what, um, we continue to refer to as this web three stack and there's any number of different, uh, primitives in it now, any number of different, protocols, there's increased cross-chain capabilities. Um, and so it's just easier if you're a developer or an entrepreneur to actually apply this technology to a use case at scale in an affordable way. Still imperfect, as, as you will well know, but it's possible. So um, is that like... So that, oh, sorry. Yeah, go. What were you going to say? Um, I was just going to say that led us effectively to, as this Web3 stack had matured, we kind of felt, okay, we don't just need to invest in infrastructure now. Um, so we still do, but only when it's at the commercialization stage. We still invest in some key primitives. We still invest in that convergence thesis, now extended into things like AR and VR. So if seeing what would identify as an AR, AR startup or a VR startup um, leverage Web3 infrastructure business models. And, uh, and then increasingly started to work at the middleware layer. So still today, a lot of people, when they think about adoption of Web3, they're thinking of consumers, which of course is correct. But actually, sub 5% of the global developer population are using this technology, even today. Um, and so this stuff needs to be made more usable. And the more developers that begin to leverage it, the more... Um, the business models that, that and, and the principles that that we we believe drive Web three, um, digital property rights, sovereignty of the user, um, sovereignty of their wealth, data assets, um, and the kind of um, the uh, the kind of new forms of governance models. Um, the more that they'll be used, deployed, and and go mainstream. So we started to do a lot of middleware, and then of course the application layer. And so if you kind of fast forward to where we are now, um, we're about 180 investments. We're accelerating 50 a quarter. The plan is to do 200 over the next um, next year. And there's really a, a huge range of use case there. So we still do DeFi. We have a dedicated DeFi program. We accelerate certain ecosystems, Polkadot, Polygon, uh, Hedera, Filecoin, IPFS. Um, but we also are now starting to work with large organizations that can help commercialize and, and take different innovations to market. And so mm. we just announced a program um, this quarter with Farfetch. Farfetch is a um, an e-commerce, uh, listed e-commerce company um, for the luxury industry. They have their own Farfetch portal, farfetch.com, but actually they do like end-to-end e-commerce from 
you know, website transactions, payment gateways, all the way through to point of sale terminals, for wow. example, for Gucci, for for three quarters of the luxury industry. And so we're running a thematic program with them on uh, Web3 luxury lifestyle. Um, and there's just this huge wave of interest from whether it's media, gaming, um, industry, of course, financial services every week now and new financial services uh, organizations kind of uh, committing to the space. Was it JP Morgan? I think just uh, did their first DeFi trial this week. So it's really been amazing to watch everything that's happened over the last eight and a half years. On the one hand, it feels like a lifetime. It is effectively a big chunk of my lifetime. On the other hand, it still blows my mind from that Bitcoin conference of, I don't know what, let's say there's 50, 60 people in a room. Yeah. So the industry, uh, the, we can actually call ourselves an industry, finally. Hey guys, I want to take a second and talk to you about our newest sponsor, angelblock.io. It's about that time in the bear market that we actually have to take a look at which projects have taken the do's and the don'ts from all the previous waves, bull and bear markets that we've had and built out real decentralized projects that are going to be successful and take this blockchain and crypto world that we're into the next level. Traditional fundraising is very clunky and traditional investing in crypto is very clunky as well. I know I'm a VC at Drew Adventures. AngelBlock is really, really cool. And it's a new DeFi protocol that's solving not only the issues of fundraising for digital assets, but more compliance, transparency, real decentralization. They have on-chain governance, staking, lending, secondary marketplaces for the trading of tokens, all these different ways that you can actually interact with the startup and the token and the project that you're actually investing in. There's a whole community here. AngelBlock is that new compliant platform that's safe and easy to use in order to weed out all the scams. It's so cool. It's built on top of Ethereum, but it's multi-chain by design. <clears throat> They'll also be involved in the mentoring process. There's a phenomenal community that AngelBlock has built. It doesn't cost anything. Go check out the community. Go to their website, angelblock.io. Sign up to their email to stay up to date. You'll have a chance to win some really cool AngelBlock NFTs. And this is only for Untold Stories listeners. Thank you, guys. And you're and you're seeing that. I mean, exactly what you said was going to happen happened. Just just yesterday, there was an, there was an, uh, an announcement by by Meta, the parent of Facebook. That now you can store NFTs on Instagram, which they own. They own Instagram. And they're using Arweave to actually, that blockchain, that layer one is what they're using to store digital collectibles, not Ethereum, not, you know, some of the other ones that we know. So this pie is big and it can just continue growing even bigger. There's room for, like you said, there's room for you to incubate 50 a quarter or more because this industry is so so early still, but that makes me nervous a little bit because, you know, you mentioned, uh, some of the earlier days, like, like the IOTA days, uh, I didn't personally think I made a lot of bad investments because I didn't think it was early. I thought the IOTA days were like, we're hitting critical mass, but I was wrong. It took another five or six years, even more. So are we still too early is are we at now this like critical mass, do you think, where we can actually make these connections and these plug in into the middleware of the of the world? Yeah, well, I mean, there's no simple answer to it in a way. Yeah. So on the one hand, what I can say is we're in a, de a very different time now. I think you mentioned at the top end, you referenced kind of crypto winter. I'd actually challenge we're in a crypto winter like a technological winter. Um, I think we're in a sustained bear market. Um, and the reason why I kind of challenge that is, and maybe it's semantics, but you, yeah. if you look at, you know, the, the crypto winter term is derived from the AI, AI winter, which lasted a couple of decades. And if you actually look at the characteristics of that winter, um, it had a number of characteristics. Um, and the, the kind of primary one was that money dried up. There wasn't money being invested into AI. So there's no point in working in it. It was very R&D intensive. Um, at that point, it was a long way from commercialization. 
And so there the literally was not money being invested into the space. Now, that did happen in 2018 and 19, after the whole uh, 17 ICO boom and bust. Yeah. Money dried up. You know, we we were accelerating startups in 18, and we taught them how to raise money without saying they were a Web3 startup. It was like, how do you obfuscate, you know, oh, all, all the kind of... Um, all the baggage that comes with 17, um, but still effectively be a Web3 startup. Yeah. Um, and so Biconomy with the Bikeco token was a great example of that. Boson Protocol, another one, we worked with those two in the, mi- in the middle of 2018 winter. They both found it really hard to raise money. I mean, they were month to month. And they were trying to build, I mean, Bico effectively, for, for Bico to have worked, you'd have to believe that there's going to be an explosion, a Cambrian explosion of DAP usage, which back then nobody believed. Um, for Boson to work, they were solving a fundamental uh, problem of physical to digital redemption. They kind of preempted the whole metaverse narrative. Again, like you'd have to really fundamentally believe anything was going to be happening on chain uh, beyond financial use cases where you would want to pair it with a physical thing in the real world. Not many people believe that right um and so that was a real winter there was no money if you look now and this kind of was a trend we first noticed in summer last year so what are we 21 so 20 sorry 22 so summer 21 um for the first time ever even when the markets like listed assets would crash 60 70 percent venture capital still ended up being deployed every day in party rounds, i.e. rounds that would close in 24 hours. You know, VCs were doing no due diligence. They weren't allowed to do due diligence. It was like either you're in or you're out. And they knew if they didn't ape in, you know, they, they would miss out on that opportunity. Valuations were sky high. And of course, you can you could call out a bubble or anything else, but but it didn't stop. It hasn't stopped. No. There's actually an overcapitalization in Web3 right now. There is more money in venture funds that has to be deployed into digital assets than there are good startups. That's never happened before in the history of Web3. So that's new, and that's fundamentally different to me than a winter. So um, in a winter, you need both like the venture side to totally dry up and any secondary market to be pummeled. And we've been That's pummeled in the secondary point. market, but the but the, the venture side is is still still really strong. And for us to invest in 200 startups, we will do diligence 5,000 plus startups from all around the world, working on all layers of the stack from infrastructure primitives, middleware, application layer, across a growing range of um industry and nfts really extended that now into um creative industries and social so there's never been a time like this as far as i'm aware so on the one hand there's a the level of momentum where i'm not concerned this is the thing (laughs) there's been lots of moments before in the past where you're like am i really i mean i you know i fundamentally feel that there's something happening here but then i don't know beginning of 18 i think everybody probably had a little wobble um beyond maybe bitcoin maxis who felt justified you know that uh, that everything other than bitcoin was trash um so what did but now what did, i was just going to say so what did you know companies then do to survive like by economy i love that we just had them on the show like five or six episodes ago um and some of the other ones like some of these other, some of these like OG companies like Kraken and Bitfinex, they get into like crypto winter mode and they know how to survive and come out on the other side. But a lot of people yeah. really don't understand. And my listeners are executives at a lot of these early startups who are worried like, how do we get through this? How much cash runway do we need? Should we be building? Should we hibernating? When do we come back online? There's so many questions. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I guess this is the the benefit of hindsight if you've survived a few cycles, right? Um, yeah. Is that you know you know you're in a cycle, and you know 
there's going to continue to be cycles. There's going to continue to be moments of extreme hubris um, where everybody's launching a Web3 startup, multi-billion dollar valuations. That's going to happen again and again and again. Um, it's just the floor seems to raise to the last time, all time high, right? It kind of just finds this base. And I think we're back to like 2014 levels in, in, in terms of how you price ETH and Bitcoin, which is interesting. Um, but at the same time, um, so you know these things are going to happen. So the principles or the discipline, that the fiscal discipline that we've had at Outlier is whatever we do in a bull market, has to be able to be sustained in a bear market. And so we kind of call it um, evergreen thinking. So in a bull market, it's easy to think you're a genius. It's nice. easy to think you're destined to be, you know, whatever, multi-trillion company. Um, and everything's incredibly aggressive. Everyone's salaries are massively inflated. I mean, just trying to even keep people focused in the job is hard because they're, being poached every two seconds by somebody that's going to do two, yeah. three times their salary and they're going to get stake in a token and that could moon. And everyone's, it's like very dizzying. It's very disorienting. But from a planning perspective, as sea level in a, in a startup or a scale up, you've got to be really disciplined and say, okay, look, yes, we could go in all these different directions. You know, we're, we're notionally cash rich. Um, but then, you know, most of those things disappear like very, very quickly when the market turns. Um, and if you've if you've got to carry it away, you can you can risk the bank, right? You, you're you can spread yourself too thin. So it's kind of this evergreen thinking. So if you look at Boson, if you look at Biconomy, actually they're really great examples because they knew how hard it was to raise. They'd raised in a bear market, actually in a crypto winter, and they have that kind of survival experience that they're, they're, they're always focused on product. Look, we've got to ship product. We've got to be able to ship product without a token. So by economy only did a token two years into their uh, product runway. You know, they, they, um, it was only when they really needed a token to optimize the network that they launched it. They didn't just launch a token for the sake of it. Um, and both of them made sure they raised at least two years plus operating cash and they could live within that and they maintain that cash runway. Um, and so I, we can't take credit for that. The founders did that. They, they could have not done that, but it's a consistent theme for projects that work with Outlier. So we have- um, Very good. That's we have a great advice, core... by the way. Thank you. Yeah, look, we have our core accelerator, um, which is working with projects pre-seed seed. Um, sometimes late seed. And then we have a, another um, proposition advisory, advisory project called Ascent. We use this mountaining and energy base camp Ascent. The Ascent is later stage and it's for teams that are like six months away from TGE. And they want to, they want to sense check their token design. They want to have token engineering simulation done on the token economy, stress test it. Oh, they want cool. to do kind of like a, a hygiene test on the kind of tax structuring, the regulatory, you know, if they ticked all the right boxes. And then of course, like that kind of community momentum building to, to, as you do, if you were listing a stock, right, you need to do the roadshow, you need to create demand for the thing before it lists. Um, and then exchange strategy, market making, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but in that entity, right now, we've got 35 projects of 180 that could launch could do could launch a token they could go live with their their network event um tomorrow um but they're not now some of them might in uh, towards the end of the year some might in q1 but many of them are also evergreen they've also got 18 to 24 months cash runway which in a bull market sounds insane why are you conserving money? VCs want to give you money to deploy yes. into, into growth. And you do have to do that, right? VC money is growth money. You don't take it if you don't want to grow aggressively, right? But at the same time, 
um, a founder who can say, yeah, I'm going to deploy it in growth, but it's going to be sustainable growth, growth I can sustain over, you know, 12, 24. And generally in, in crypto, that's enough. That's long enough to be able to, to, to kind of see out any market volatility, deliver yeah. product, ship product. And you know what? Your token, if you go out with a token, it's going to get hammered like everyone else's token. Like it, it all goes up and it all goes down and there are no other fundamentals that drive it. Um, and so you just need to be prepared that your, ha your token might get hammered. If everything gets hammered, your token's going to get hammered. So how are you going to pay the bills? Um, you know, you certainly don't want all your treasury to be in Bitcoin or ETH because that would have also gone down too. Sadly, you need fiat, right? And those that manage treasury effectively, they've, yeah. they've got fiat uh, in their treasury. They're evergreen in, in their financial planning. They have sustained growth. They can kind of see that out. They can survive it out. And guess what? When they do that and the market recovers, and this happened with Ocean Protocol, they were kind of peak 17, I think. Then their turn got a hammer at 90%. They just did a huge raise. I remember the, the community were up in arms. You screwed us. Yeah. I remember one of the founders yeah. even saying they were getting death threats if they went to an event. Not because they did anything, just the market crashed. Yeah. And, and they, they just happened to close at the peak. Um, but they use that money and they continue to deploy. And guess what? When the markets recovered two years later and the fact that they were still there, still shipping, that they were one of the fastest recoveries in crypto. I think like top three recovery um, back to their all time high uh, in a matter of months. And so wow. it's just staying in the game, you know, that's it's having really, that long term that's really, mentality. That's what it is. If the timing is, if you're in the bad timing, then figure out a way to stick out the timing and uh and build yourself some runway but i love what you said earlier i'm gonna like try to throw that in the beginning of the episode you said how um if you can raise in a bear market then you know how to be conservative in the bull market and that's such a beautiful thing unfortunately also we're out of time but jamie burke thank you so much for for coming on untold stories today i really appreciate it and i look forward to having you on again soon yeah look thanks for having me on and, and what i just say if you don't mind a kind of a plug is you know, we're actively, we're always taking in applications. Um, we're running five cohorts, Q4, but we're already now recruiting for Q1. Um, within that, we've got some really interesting thematics. Um, a big one will be around ZK and uh, ZK rollups, zero knowledge technology, really looking at how there's a, there's a huge amount of use cases and industries that cannot carry out economic activity on chain at the moment because there is no privacy by default yeah, that makes sense um, and so for us this is this is how we're gonna next level web3 is how we're gonna ex extend and expand use case so if anybody's listening to this and they're working on uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily fundamental zk technology but looking to leverage it to expand the use case where uh, privacy by default either in a consumer context or a b2b context is critical to the use case Make sure you apply. It's outlieradventures.io slash basecamp. Amazing. Thank you so much. We'll have it all in the in the show notes as well. And I'm gonna start, I have to go on a new, I'm gonna do a theme show on ZK rollups and ZK proof and snarks and everything like that. We've covered it lightly, but it seems like that's where a lot of the technology is going. But uh thank you again. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Samuel.